Guys, let me just say that this week will offend some of you because many of you have probably taught this before, what I'm about to attack. A very common idea, especially among so-called grace teachers, is that all sins are equal. All of us are equal in that we've all sinned and fell short of the glory of God and required a Savior, but that does not mean every action is equally as harmful to us. While I appreciate the desire to even the playing field so that we do not think of ourselves as better than others who are doing certain activities, we do need to avoid this illogical idea that pedophilia is no worse than cheating on your homework. Christians' favorite place to say that all sins are equal is when they're talking about homosexuality because it's such a controversial issue. And you don't want to sound like a bigot, so it's common to use an argument like this. Okay, now this is a quote that I read in an article recently. He says, Because all sin is equal, this idea of homosexuality being some terrible hatred sin is moot. The real stickler is sin itself, and all sin is hateful. Did you stuff yourself at the last family barbecue? Well, you might as well have grabbed your stripper pole and danced for dollar bills. Now, the guy is being serious. I understand the motive of not wanting religious pricks to judge themselves better than dirty sinners, but this idea that all sin affects us the same way is absurd. The guy goes on, he says, Homosexuality is really no worse than yelling the F-bomb after stubbing your toe. I've had much opportunity to observe that many Christians judge some sinful acts harsher than others. Yet the Bible clearly tells us not to do so. Let me ask you, dude, where in God's name is this so explicitly written in the Bible that certain acts are not harsher than other acts? You're saying rape and murder of children is no worse than a swear word? And no, the problem is not that we judge behavior. It would behoove us to do more of that. Paul says it's to our shame in 1 Corinthians 6 that we don't have judges among us pertaining to the matters of this life. The problem is that we judge people. But it is wisdom to recognize certain behaviors cause more damage than others. The only thing equal about sin is that we've all done it. We're all lawbreakers, even if we have done one infraction against the law. James 2.10, we clearly all needed forgiveness from a legal perspective. If this much is true. The faulty reasoning here is a view of sin that gives us demerits in the eyes of God rather than seeing sin as a corrupting entity that destroys us. The problem is we've misunderstood the inherent nature of sin itself. We thought sin made God angry at us, but God's not angry at you. He hates sin because sin hurts and corrupts us, his children. God was never holding our sins against us in the first place. The cross shows us he is pure forgiveness. There was not a moment in time or a spot in God's personality before he was Mr. Forgiveness, in which he was holding those sins against us. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So much of the ridiculous trite about all sin being equal is delivered out of this misplaced understanding that God himself is looking at us differently based on the degree of our sin. To think God looks at us through a sliding sin scale is ridiculous. He doesn't see any sin at all. He sees Jesus. But so in an effort to convince people they're forgiven, some grace teachers, they, they try to say all sin's the same anyway. It doesn't matter. Look, dude, sin never mattered to God to begin with. It mattered to us. Sin didn't piss God's narcissistic ego off. The problem of sin was it destroyed us has a negative consequence on us. Sin has its own intrinsic punishment and that the action itself destroys us. That's why sin is an issue to God. Not because he's angry with us, but because he loves us so much that he hates that sinful cancer that's destroying us. So if I go out saying, I'll just do whatever the hell I please because it's all the same to God anyway, I missed the point. It's not an issue of how much you can get away with 
and legally and still have God like you, the issue is that you're harming yourself and certain actions have far greater ramifications on our lives. Jaywalking is not going to mess up your life as committing adultery on your wife and snorting coke off a hooker's butt, okay? Sin is putting your own hand in the meat grinder. And there are degrees of depravity to which you can harm yourself deeper and deeper and deeper. Are we forgiven? Yes. Love, of course. Self-harming, that's the issue. Not to mention harming others, harming your family, being a bad example and negatively influencing corporate society in a way that you were not naturally created for. That is the issue because there is no such thing as personal sin. Every sin is corporate. Every sin affects the entire camp. The human mass is one corporate entity. We're all of the same family. So you can't say, well, he's sinning, but he's not hurting anybody else. Every sin hurts everybody else. John 19, 11, Jesus himself articulates that some sins are greater than others. He says to his persecutors, he says, you have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. He's saying, look, you guys are just the pawns, but Judas knew better. Jesus, uh, Judas's sin was more intense of, of a sin of conscience. Did he mean that Judas was unloved or unforgiven? Of course not. But Judas's own guilt and remorse over this murder, it ate him up to the degree that he killed himself. Look at the publican and the Pharisee. The publican's sins were not so much an issue because of his humility and contrition, whereas the Pharisee's self-righteousness was condemned because he wasn't receiving the forgiveness. He was just touting his own self-righteousness. Religious is a heinous sin. It directly tries to replace Jesus by your own human attempts to please God. Jesus is saying these religious folks are going to have it worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, indicating that self-righteousness is more destructive than idolatry and homosexuality. But that doesn't mean sexual immorality is no worse for you than getting a speeding ticket or eating too many late night candy bars. No, because we've lacked so much common sense in this issue. Let me tell you what I am not saying. I am not saying that it's okay to judge people. And I'm not saying we should measure our sins against one another. I'm not saying we should cast stones you know, go find a hooker to stone if we're not snorting coke off her butt. I'm not saying that we should think of ourselves better than somebody else. But we can convey all of these ideas without this faulty argument that every sin is somehow equal. The issue is that certain activities affect us in disproportionate ways. Kicking a dog is not the same as killing babies or starting a holocaust. Does God love us all equally in spite of our sins? Of course he does. He loves Adolf Hitler as much as he loves Heidi Baker, whether you like that or not. But let's say Heidi gossiped about someone. Is that as egregious a sin as killing six million Jews? Does it have the same level of practical consequence? Come on, wake up, smell the coffee. Let's come back to reality for a minute here. People commonly take Jesus' statements about adultery, for instance. You know, being uh, uh, lust, being the same as adultery, or hatred, being the same as murder. And they try to take these concepts to justify this argument that all sins are equal. Now, Jesus is just saying that all of us have broken the law. Even if not externally, we've already done it in our heart. In terms of corruption, boom, there it is. He was addressing the issues of the heart. These were self-righteous Pharisees. They didn't think they'd done anything wrong. And externally, their hands looked as clean as a whistle, but inside they were full of dead men's bones. Sin is ultimately a heart issue. C.S. Lewis, he says, hell grows up from the inside of a man, eventually takes him over. Sin corrupts our conscience and hardens our heart to love and vulnerability. It's more internal than an external thing. So should we be lighter on certain sins over others? Of course not. The fruit of all sin is death. A little fudge on your taxes could still land you in jail, wreck your family, or just, you know, cause you to be a, a greedy person. Lingering a little too long on some HBO soft porn could lead to some devastating addiction that spirals out of control, wrecks your marriage. A little bit of gossip could ruin somebody's entire reputation, make them lose their job, damage your whole family, okay? And saying this, I'm not advocating this sin consciousness in which we anally, retentively worry over every little thought and action like some introverted religious puritan, okay? 
That is a fruit of fear, guilt, lack of identity. We all make mistakes and at times sin outright intentionally. But in realizing that we are holy, that we are separated from our old nature, it should become effortless for us to live according to the truth. Sin doesn't have to be a constant struggle or expectancy in our lives. I mean, this article I just quoted, like so much other propaganda, it just rambles off with this idea that we all have a sinful flesh to overcome, yada, 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 yada. We're all in the same boat as dirty sinners, yada, yada, yada. Of course, it's a grace preacher, and that version of grace is that you'll always struggle, but at least you're forgiven. What if we stop trying to mutually identify ourselves as fellow sinners, no matter what sin you have, but rather identify ourselves as glorious new creations that our fellow man was included in Jesus 2,000 years ago, whether he realizes it or not, irrespective of whatever sinful propensity he may be dealing with. So look, bring it back to this idea of certain degrees of sin. First John, you know, it says to pray for people that are in sin. And he says, but then there is a sin that leads to death. And if you see someone in that, you don't need to pray about it. Well, what is that? That sounds pretty hopeless. And then our Catholic brothers, they run off and you know pull out their sin calculator, break everything into mortal and venial sins, and it just gets really complicated. And there are different hoops you have to jump through to get certain ones forgiven, etc. Look, I'm not trying to complicate the sin issue. I'm actually trying to bring some simplicity and clarity, hopefully a little common sense as well. In context here, John is convincing Christians they're not sinners and shouldn't be sinning anymore. And he's saying in his letter, we know we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. He is literally talking about unbelievers who haven't moved into that reality of their new birth and they're still walking in unbelief, death, darkness, hardness of heart. The sin that leads to death is basically rejecting Jesus' love, the only package that forgiveness comes in. It's the hatred and despair of unbelief itself. And so is there no hope for unbelievers? What, what is John saying? He's saying, look, you don't have to be stressed out over all these guys, okay? You're, you're going to be surrounded with unbelievers your whole life. And while most of the church, they teach that we should be weeping and wailing and praying for the unbelievers. And while this passage does not in any way forbid us for praying for them, the gist here is don't worry your little head over it all. Don't be having to carry these burdens. Dude, religion heaps this massive burden for the lost on you. And of course, we should have a ravenous delight in sharing the gospel. But the issue here is the joy and delight of the good news, not being burdened and weighed down, worrying about the unbelief of the world. John is saying, focus primarily on helping believers who are open to correction. Don't waste your time banging your head against the wall of every hard-hearted, obstinate person. So in summary, don't think that it's okay to just do whatever because it's all water under the bridge anyway. Certain actions harm us more than others. Running with scissors is not as bad as juggling chainsaws. I would recommend neither, but look, God loves you regardless, okay? And if you think otherwise, that's fine. You're just a beloved idiot. Love you guys. We'll see you soon. <laughs> I came here to Cana tired worn out and like with the really dead heart a dead heart and a dream job and um and coming to cana and just being immersed in the gospel and being able to marinate in it all summer um, has really awakened my heart like just having a greater understanding of god's love for me the whole new meaning of like it is finished that's really alive to me right now that I can really rest in him really trust in him um, so yeah just uh, a heart of seeing God <laughs> like really love me pursue me chase me down with his love Visit thenewmystics.com slash schools to see our finalized calendar of mystical schools for the next year. John will be in Brisbane, Australia, December 5 to 7, Woohoo! and Houston, Texas, January 2015. In February, he'll be in Liverpool, England, Reykjavik, Iceland, and Basel, Switzerland. 
In March 2015, he'll be in Las Vegas. Chico, California. Colorado, April 24 to 26. And join us south of the border for our Mexico mission. We'll minister to thousands from around the country. It's our most affordable mission trip ever and folks are already signing up, so lock in a spot early.